Let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of 1 Samuel this morning for our scripture reading. And as you're finding your place there in 1 Samuel chapter number 1, let's stand together for the reading of God's word. 1 Samuel chapter number 1. Uh, the verses that we'll read this morning were also in the handout that you received on your way in. So if you don't have a copy of God's word, you can look there uh, this morning. 1 Samuel chapter number 1. And we'll begin reading in verse number 1. 1 Samuel Chapter 1 and verse number 1. Now there was a certain man of, Rava, of uh, Ramathim Sophim of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, an Aphrodite. And he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penina his wife and to her sons and to her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary also provoked her sore, for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah, her husband, to her, Hannah, why weepest thou, and why eatest thou not, and why is thy heart grieved? Am not I better to thee than ten sons? So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli, the priest, sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul, and prayed unto the Lord, and wept sore. And she vowed a vow, and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thy handmaid a, a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall be no razor come upon his head. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the service that we've enjoyed this morning, honoring uh, mothers, Lord. We thank you for the gift of the mothers here in this congregation. And Lord, as we turn to your word now and uh, read this account, I pray that our hearts would be challenged and comforted and that you would instill purpose into every single one of our lives. Uh, because of the time spent in your word this morning. We pray that you would use the preaching of your word to that end. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Well, it certainly is our desire that every mom would be encouraged today. We even hope that some dads learn and grow today. I heard about a dad last Mother's Day who gave his wife for Mother's Day an iron. <laughs> On Father's Day, he received an ironing board. Folks, we can do better than that, amen? And so on this Mother's Day, we pray that everyone grows and is edified, but especially moms. We thank the Lord for moms. Motherhood does not get much encouragement from our society today. In fact, it takes great courage to be a mom in America today, and we just bless you and thank you. I'd like to ask every mom to stand. Wherever you are in the auditorium, we want you to stand up. We want to see where you are, and let's thank them for their contribution to our lives, to our nation, to our church. God bless every single one of you. What a great crowd of moms today. Thank you. you may be seated. God bless you, and thank you for all that you do and all that you've done. We live in a nation that does not appreciate family. They have done their best, many in various educational circles and governmental places, to harm the family. They have legalized entities that are not true families. They have done their best even to deny God's very basic creation of male and female. This is the world we live in today. The feminist movement deplores the idea of a mother at home with children and raising them for Jesus Christ. The abortion doctrine is a doctrine that speaks ill of life itself and is anti-family to the core. Back in 1990, 30 to 34 year olds, 60% of them, had been married by the age of 30 to 34, and 
of that 60%, they had at least one child. Now, some 34 years later, we find that the average age for those that are marrying, or those that are 30 to 40, the average is down to 27% from 60%. In other words, younger people are turning away from God's institution, the family. They're turning away from the idea of coming together in holy matrimony. They're turning away from the idea of raising children in this world. One sociologist, not even a Christian, wrote it this way. He said, people are opting out of America. They're, they're not optimistic about it. They're not having kids. They're not marrying. They're not, uh, they're not uh, wanting to have a family. The pool of emotionally and economically viable men is shrinking every day, which lessens household formation. Selfishness is on the rise. Lust is on the rise. People desire to have a cheap thrill, but they're unwilling to make the commitment to holy matrimony, to raising up a godly family. And it will be the ruin of this nation if we turn away from God's ordained plan for every successful culture, and that is the family. Today, we have an opportunity to thank people, and especially moms, who see the value of the family, and the value of children, and the value of holy matrimony. Proverbs 31, 28 says of you, her children will rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Abraham Lincoln said, no man is poor who has a godly mother. John Wesley, the great preacher of yesteryear, back when the Methodist church believed the Bible and preached the gospel and, and did not ordain gay clergy. Back when the Methodists were biblical, John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, said, I learned more about God from my mom than all the theologians in England. Mothers have had a great impact on families, on churches, and on nations as well. This morning, we opened the Bible and we learned about a courageous mother, a mother whose name was Hannah a mother who was a woman of great courage. She was married to a man by the name of Elkanah. Elkanah, in the chapter we read a moment ago, was coming up to a place called Shiloh, about 34 miles north of modern Jerusalem, before the worship at the temple of Jerusalem. And they were making this journey annually to sacrifice and to pray to God and to seek the blessing of God on their family. And wise is the family that seeks first the kingdom of God. Wise is the husband and the wife and the mother and the father who want the blessing of God on their home. And so it was that Hannah made this journey. But Hannah's life was not a bed of roses. And every mom here could tell us that there has been time and times in your life when things weren't going well with the children or you were concerned about your marriage or you were wondering how the bills would be paid or you had tragedy strike your home. And we see that in the life of Hannah. It was not a bed of roses, not at all. I want you to see, though, the courage that she had. I want you to notice in the passage this morning Hannah's courage even in the midst of her discouragement. And we see her discouragement in verse number 5. The Bible says, Unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah. But the Lord had shut up her womb, and her adversary also provoked her sore for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. Good motherhood does not begin with perfect circumstances. Mothering can be tough and difficult, and, and we understand that this morning and see it in Hannah's life. I heard about a father who came home from work. It was time for dinner. His eight-year-old daughter was out on the sidewalk, and she was standing like this and just looked disgusted. Father walked up to the little girl. He said, what is wrong with you? She said, I've been having trouble with your wife all day long today. <laughs> I don't think those of us men in this room who think we have it so hard and we have it so hard at work and we have a commute and no one understands how bad the burden is. I don't know that we understand what it might be like to be home with three or four toddlers for an entire day and certainly moms could tell us about that. But what made Hannah's situation difficult was the fact that Elkanah, her beloved, was in a polygamist relationship. The Bible indicates that Elkanah had two wives 
and uh, he had uh, Penaniah, and he had Hannah. And though this was practiced by the Jews from time to time, God never condoned it. God does not condone this practice at all. In fact, he condemns adultery in the Bible. This was a time when the judges were ruling in Israel, and the Bible says that often, according to Judges 21-25, the Israelites did that which was right in their own eyes. They just kind of made it up on the fly. And Elkanah stepped out of God's will and had a second wife, and you might imagine for Hannah how difficult that would have been. The devil tries to say that it's fun to be promiscuous and it's, it's fun to live outside of God's boundaries, but in reality, Hannah was miserable because of her husband's lust and because of her husband's sin. She was not happy. She was miserable. Her heart ached. God's intent for marriage is one man and one woman for life. This is God's will, God's desire Thank God for those of you that are working to strengthen your marriage. And thank God for every single mom and single dad that's here just endeavoring to draw closer to the Lord this morning. But we see Hannah had courage in the midst of her discouragement. Why was she discouraged? Well, first of all, she was barren. The Bible says in verse 6, the Lord had shut up her womb. This would be an ever-present stigma in the life of a Jewish woman. A Jewish woman's great desire would be that they might have children and desire to raise that child for the Lord. And it was difficult for Hannah because the Bible actually says the Lord had shut up her womb. And I want you to take note of that. Because in one passage the Bible says children are the heritage of the Lord, the fruit of the womb is His reward. And in another passage it says the Lord had shut up her womb. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a classic illustration of what we call the sovereignty of God. That is to say God has control over His creation. It doesn't mean we always understand His sovereign conditions. It, it just simply means He's God and we are not. And for some reason God at least for this time in her life, had shut up her womb. And it was very difficult for her. And I have prayed, Terry and I, with many women and young families desiring to have children. And we've known many that never had children. And it has been and is for some this morning a burden upon them. And yet we know in the Christian life, sometimes God allows adversity and hopelessness and difficult situations to bring us to a place where we will truly grow in grace. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and are, the, and are the called according to His purpose. We know that God has a purpose in adversity and in difficulty. But Hannah didn't really understand all of that right at first. And when your child is sick, when you're unable to have children, when your marriage is not what it should be, you may see this as adversity and difficulty, and indeed it is. God then, in closing Hannah's womb, was about to show his will to her. He was about to show her that he was able to do whatever it was that he determined to do. And we see this throughout the Bible. Sarah, for example, uh, was barren until God gave her Isaac well into her 90s when she was shopping for maternity clothes. Rachel was barren until God gave her Joseph, who was later going to save his people in the time of famine. Elizabeth in the New Testament was barren until God opened her womb and she brought forth John the Baptist. And all of this, I'm saying this morning, was not according to the mother's timetable, but according to God's timetable. This is the sovereignty of God. And when there are situations in our lives that we don't understand, when we cannot trace His hand, we must trust His heart. Spurgeon said, there is no attribute more comforting to God's children than that of God's sovereignty. Under the most adverse circumstances, in the most severe trials, they believe that sovereignty has ordained their afflictions and that sovereignty overrules them and that sovereignty will sanctify them all. In other words, God never wastes a trial. God always has a purpose in trials. Hannah was going through a trial. And she was going to trust him through this trial. She was barren. I want you to notice, secondly, she was belittled. The Bible says in verse number 6, 
that she had an adversary that provoked her and it made her to fret. The adversary was the other woman. That's how it always is. They're going to fight. They're going to pull each other's hair. They're going to say, ha ha. That's how it always is when sin comes into a life. And the Bible says this other woman made her fret, made her worry. You see, whenever someone moves away from God's plan for the family, there is disharmony, there is strife. The police will have to come because of the domestic violence. The counselors will have to spin their rate up for all the counseling that will need to be done. The children will struggle at night whenever sin comes into a family. And this was the case of Hannah. I'm just saying to you, this highly revered woman didn't have easy street. She wasn't a woman that had it all going her way. She had troubles in her life, too. Every year it got worse for Hannah. She was taunted. She was made to fret. The anxiety would build. Spurgeon said, anxiety does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows, but only empties today of its strength. And Hannah was becoming depleted with it. Year after year, no child. Year after year, going to Shiloh, hearing the chiding of the other woman. Hannah had courage in the midst of discouragement. But I want you to see, secondly, Hannah had courage to pray. Hannah was going to do something with her discouragement. She wasn't going to get on Facebook and complain. She wasn't going to call somebody up and say, let's go party. She wasn't going to find some way to make the problem worse. She was going to seek the face of God to make this problem better. Notice, if you would, the Bible tells us about her prayer in verse 10. It says, and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but wilt give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give unto him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. Hannah is speaking here of what is called the Nazarite vow. It was a vow of the Jewish people that spoke of holiness, no razor upon his head. It also included not touching alcohol or the fruit of the vine. It also included not being near dead bodies or graveyards. It was not something that is familiar to us in this era, but in this way she was saying, God, he will be dedicated strictly to you as the most conservative of your people. And furthermore, she would give his life to the service of the temple as soon as he was able to serve. Hannah did the right thing in the midst of her trial. Instead of letting the trial push her away from God, she let the trial bring her closer to God. I'm going to say that again, because moms, you're going to face this. There's going to come times in the life of moms and dads, and, and someone's not going to be nice to you at church, and you're going to say, well, my child got a C at the Christian school. I'm out of here. Well, they're all hypocrites over there. Why aren't there more perfect people like me? Hannah could have said, this whole thing about worshiping God, this is a joke. God, if this is how you're going to bless me for going to your house all the time, I'm out of here. But that's not what Hannah did. And friends, don't let your trial push you away from God. Hannah sought God through her trial. The Bible says in Psalm 61.1, Hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. For th from the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Thank God we have a rock. His name is Jesus Christ. George Mueller, the great missionary who had an orphanage with 10,000 children at one time in the orphanages of Bristol, England. George Mueller said, The beginning of anxiety is the end of faith and the beginning of true faith is the end of anxiety hannah brought her anxiety to god hannah brought her anxiety to god thank god there's counsel and there's friends and sometimes the right counselor the right friend will 
point you to God, but the sooner you learn as a mom, as a dad, as a teen, to bring your burden to the Lord, the sooner the peace returns to your life. Hannah, this godly mother, knew how to come to the Lord with her need. I want you to see, first of all, her prayer. She prays to God. Prayer moves the arm that moves the world. She, she came to the only one that could really make a difference about all of this. Only God could do something in this case. And, and the Bible says in Luke 18 and verse 1, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that, that men ought always to pray and not to faint, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Now listen to me. There's not a perfect parent in this room. There is not a perfect parent in this room. Those of us with our kids grown up and raised, we could say, I wish I would have done this differently. I, I wish I would have done this better. And if you still have kids at home, pour your life and your time, not just a Sunday morning, you're on the right track. Get them back. Get them into the youth group on Wednesday night. But then open the Bible at home once in a while. Pray for your meals. Don't allow sinful television. I could go on with that. This isn't a message on child rearing. I, I'm just trying to say to you here this morning, you're, you're not going to be a perfect parent, but you can be a praying parent. Every parent can be a praying parent. I thank the Lord for a praying mother. My mother was a godly woman who took time to pray with me each morning, every night. I remember as a missionary son in Seoul, South Korea, living in a different culture, surrounded by strange things, far away from my friends, struggling with peer pressure, struggling with sports and school and all of it, and my mom coming into my room every night, talking about the day, and then saying, well, why don't we talk to the Lord about it? And praying for me, and praying with me, no man is a poor man who has a praying mother, a praying father. You will not be a perfect parent, but you can be a praying parent. Hannah was a praying mom. I heard the prayer of a mother recently that touched my heart. Forgive me, Lord, for all the tasks that went undone today. But this morning, when my child toddled in and said, Mommy, play? I simply had to say yes. And between the puzzles and trucks and the blocks and the dolls and the old hats, the books and the giggles, we shared a thousand special thoughts, a hundred hopes, dreams, and hugs. And tonight, when prayer time came, and he folded his hands and softly whispered, thank you, God, for mommy and daddy and toys and french fries, but especially for mommy playing, I knew it was a day well wasted, and I knew that you would understand. Thank God for mothers who love their children, who play with their children, but most of all, who pray for their children. Hannah prayed. And notice not only her prayer, notice her promise in verse 11. She says, God, Lord, I'm going to vow this vow to you. By the way, don't ever be afraid to vow a vow. Sometimes people say, well, I don't make commitments. I don't fill out commitment cards. I don't, I don't promise nothing. Really? Have you ever bought a car? Somebody help me here. You ever bought a house? So you just don't vow to God, but you'll vow to GMC. Come on, somebody help me here. It's okay to make promises to God. And Hannah makes one right here. She said, God, I'm going to promise you this. If you ever give me a child, I'm going to give him right back to you. Lord, if you bless me with a child, I'm going to give that child back to you. She said, then I will give, I will bestow I will dedicate him back to you. Hannah did not bargain with the Lord. Rather, she proved her spirituality by willingly offering God her best. She said, I'll give you my best, Lord. She pledges her son to God. This prayer was not merely answered because of the promise she made. It was answered also because of the purpose that God had for Samuel, her son. And so it was that God heard and answered her prayer. You know, one of the great verses in the Bible for families is 3 John verse 4, which tells us, I have no greater joy than to know that my children walk in the truth. And here we see Hannah's prayer. God, you give me a child, 
I'll dedicate my life, I'll dedicate this child for your glory. We see her prayer. We see her promise. And then we see her presentation. The Bible says in chapter 1 and in verse number 19, And they rose up in the morning early and worshipped before the Lord and returned and came to their house to Ramah. And Elkanah knew his, Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Let's say that together. And the Lord remembered her. Say it again. And the Lord hears your prayer, my friend. God's not some old man up on a rocking chair in heaven who's kind of hard of hearing and kind of forgetful. No, no, no. God heard her prayer. God remembered her prayer. And, and God uh, answered the prayer. And my friend, God will remember your prayer. God remembered and then Hannah surrendered, the Bible says in verse 22. But Hannah went up not, speaking of this time after she had her son Samuel. For she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned, and then I will bring him uh, that he may appear before the Lord and there abide forever. Verse 24 says, And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bullocks and one ephah of flour and a bottle of wine and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. Here we see her remembering her promise. She's bringing Samuel as an offering to the Lord. She's bringing all these other things, the flour and the grape juice and all these things, but she's bringing her son to present him unto uh, the prophet at the temple, this man Samuel, who one day would stand before Eli and bring about the sins of Eli's own sons. This man Samuel, who would anoint and pour the oil on the head of Saul and later on the head of David. This man, the last mighty judge in this period of the children of Israel, all because of a praying mother, he was raised to the glory of God. Warren Wiersbe said, what a testimony from a godly mother. If we had more parents like Elkanah and Hannah, we would have more godly people like Samuel. Samuel belonged to the Lord for the rest of his life. Moms and dads, think of the great potential. Not just the funny things the kids do or the good athletic things they do or the grades they make, but think of the way they could stand for God if we would bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Samuel was greatly used for the glory of God. Hannah had courage in her discouraging days. Hannah had courage to pray for her child. Notice finally, Hannah had courage to give God the honor and the glory. I want you to notice in chapter 2 the response of Hannah. The Bible says in verse 1, And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee. Neither is there any rock like our God. You know, a lot of times we passionately ask God for His help. He so graciously answers, and we never thank Him. How many of you have been guilty of that? Am I the only one? God, we need a job. God, please give healing in this situation. God, would you help, help our family? And God does. And many times we just go right on our way, but not Hannah. Hannah's going to stop and she's going to give thanks to the Lord. Hannah is going to honor God for what he has done. She honors him, first of all, for the deliverance he gave. And this is deliverance from her enemy, the one that caused all of the fretting. Her mouth is shut. Why? God, her God, had answered her prayer. And she praises God eight times in three verses. Ladies, let me ask you a question. Do your friends talk about God? Hannah spoke about God eight times in three verses. If you have a friend that you can have eight conversations with and Jesus is never mentioned, the Lord is never mentioned, I mean, you got the type of friends that go on rants on Facebook but don't praise God on Facebook, you might need a new friend. You might need to find or you might need to become the kind of a woman that just honors God in your life. And I just see in this woman, Hannah, an honoring of the Lord for his deliverance. Psalm 25, 20, oh, keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed for I put my trust in thee. She gave him honor. But not only for deliverance, 
She gave him honor for the strength. She mentions it in verse 2. She says, God, you are my rock. God, verse number 3 of Psalm 31 says, For thou art my rock and my fortress, therefore my name's sake, lead me and guide me. He was the rock of her life. He was the refuge of her life. Psalm 46, 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very help in time of trouble. This weekend and especially tomorrow, we're going to remember and honor Melinda and Alana Bach. Melinda was our receptionist here at the church, one of the godliest young mothers we've ever had in this church. She began attending here when she was 16 years old, and I remember holding Alana in dedication when she was born. And as I've been praying and preparing for the services tomorrow, I've just been thinking back, just trying to just slow down a minute and think back. Some of you who've been in this church a while, you know that I file a lot, and I like to file the notes that the kids in the church give me, and hopefully for happier, hopefully for happier times, like maybe weddings and such, but sometimes for difficult times, maybe to find perspective. And the three precious children of Ben and Melinda Bach have been very communicative with me as their pastor, and I think Moms and dads, one of the signs of a healthy, growing young person is the fact that they will acknowledge a pastor, that they'll say hello, that they'll know him, that they know how to shake hands, and young men look you in the eye and, uh, and communicate and seek counsel for important times in their life. I think that those are important things for young people to have these kinds of relationships. Alana wrote to me nine beautiful letters. Allison and Austin, similarly. But the thing that touched me about the letters was that every letter spoke about their trust in the Lord and their learning from the Scriptures in this room. This mother had taught the children the value of what's going on here right now so that they weren't just checking scores and biding time they were actually hearing the Word of God and then writing to their pastor to say, this is what I learned, this is what helped me, this is what changed my life. And through it all, God has been and will be their refuge because they learned what it was to seek the Lord through their life. Hannah was able to say, the Lord is my refuge Samuel was able to say, the Lord is my refuge too. And this is why it is much more than just sitting. It is also behaving and living for the Lord that is so important in the parenting of this hour. She honored the Lord for his deliverance in her life, for the strength in her life. And finally, she honored the Lord in the service that she gave. I want you to see this. I want you to get a little picture of Hannah's life going forward as we close. Notice verse 18. But Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child girded with a linen ephod. Can you imagine that? Samuel, her son, the one she gave to the Lord. He's eight, he's 10, he's wearing the priestly garments. He's, he's, he's cleaning around the candles. He's, he's sweeping out uh, the holy place. I don't know what his job description always was, but can you imagine once a year when they came up the mountain to Shiloh, can you think of Hannah? She couldn't wait to see her son. Hey, he's not in jail. He's not doing drugs. He's not looking at wicked things on the internet. My son, she could say, he's serving God. Well, where did that begin Begin with prayer. It began with walking with the Lord and trusting the Lord. Notice what else it says in verse 19. Moreover, his mother made him a little coat. Don't you love that? Hey, this Hannah, she's quite a lady. She's a prayer warrior. She's a faithful lady. Now she's making a little coat, and she's bringing it to him, notice this, from year to year. Fellas, there's a reason for that. They grow. And I can imagine Hannah wonder how tall he is this year. Oh, I'm going to put this kind of thread. Oh, I can't wait to see my son Samuel. I miss him so. I'm so glad he's 
in the service of the Lord. What an honor. What a privilege. But I can't wait to see him. I could imagine Hannah as they got closer and closer to the place of worship. And I can imagine her looking to see the stature of her son, Samuel, how she prayed for him. Moms, you know this. It doesn't matter how old they get. It doesn't matter if they marry, if they go to the military, if they move far away. They're always in your heart. That's the heart of a mother. This was Hannah's heart, that God would use and bless her child. Hannah wanted to encourage him in the work of the Lord. Samuel was used greatly of God. Because of a mother who had courage when she had discouraging days, she kept believing, she kept praying, she kept giving the honor to God. My mother was raised in a Roman Catholic home. How many of you were raised in Roman Catholic homes? Let me see. Many of you. She thought that the way to have your sins absolved was through the sacraments and through the confessional booth. And she thought that it was by having last rites by a Catholic priest and essentially if you did enough of these types of works then maybe your sins would be absolved and you would go to heaven. And my mom was a good Catholic. In fact, she wanted to be a nun. And one day a friend of hers invited her to a youth rally at a church. And she went into that church in the south side of Chicago and for the first time she heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. She heard that salvation is not linked to a church but that it's directly linked to Jesus, to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and that you don't join a church to go to heaven, but you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. You, you turn to Christ as a sinner, and you, you ask Jesus to come in your heart. She heard that the wages of her sin was death, but the gift of God was eternal life through Jesus Christ. And so she went forward at the end of the service there with the teenagers, and she accepted Christ as her Savior. She soon found herself at a Bible college where she met my dad, and soon they were married, and soon I came along into the picture, and she was now involved in a life of serving and ministry, and what a minister and what a servant she was. A faithful helpmeet, a faithful mom. And many of you know a few years ago, God called my mother home, and in those years prior, she battled with Alzheimer's. And I tried to run over to Phoenix here and there and just to see her, and The last several times, she really didn't know who I was. She knew that I was smiling, and she would smile back, but she didn't know my name. I remember asking the doctor at the hospital she was at toward the end there, I said, it's kind of a care home, kind of a medical care home, and I said, Doc, could I take my mom, my brother was there, my wife, and some of our kids, I said, could I take my mom to a restaurant so that we don't just eat right here in this facility? Could she go outside with us? He said, well... He said, I'll let you take your mom, but now you got to keep an eye on her because your mom is a runner. (laughs) And that was one of the things with the Alzheimer's. She just escaped places. And I said, okay, we'll keep an eye on her. So this was the last time we ever had with her outside of that hospital, and we wanted to do something special. So we went to In-N-Out Burger. (laughs) Right? Some of you just lost sight of the spiritual application of this message. (laughs) And we went to In-N-Out Burger, and and we ordered up, and we were sitting there, and Mom was next to me, and we were enjoying the fellowship and the time. And I was talking to my brother across the table, and after a little while, I looked to my right, and she was gone. (laughs) And, of course, Mom had no, you know, credit cards or driver's license or anything, but she had this little gold purse she always loved, and she had brought it with her. I, I, I even wondered when we brought her, what's in that purse? But she had the purse... Even at that stage of her life, she always wanted to look right and dignified, and we took her in there with that purse. And I was looking around, looking around, and there she was at the back of the restaurant. And she was going from table to table. And she was asking people as she gave them a gospel tract from her little purse, do you know Jesus? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Do you know Jesus? She didn't know my name. She didn't know my brother's name. She didn't know her grandchildren's name. But she knew his name. And I wonder this morning, do you know him? Do 
you know Jesus? You know, really the only reason I'm standing up here this morning is because of Jesus and my mom. Do you know him? If your life ended today, would you be in heaven? Do you know Christ as your personal Savior? And moms, if you know him, I don't know what's going on in your family today, but take courage. Don't let your trial drive you away from God, but draw closer to him. Pray to him. Seek his face and see that he will meet your need like he met Hannah's need.